Hi, this is BK Black Krishna for ManForWars.com, where I'm promoting polite patriotism to help nice ladies and gents teach kids to be, look, talk, and feel great, and locally discuss and share great online info offline as better people make it better places to live worldwide. So check out ManForWars.com for more on that. Uh, but this video is called 12 Studies with 50,000 People Say Red Meat is Not Bad for You. That's a dozen studies with 50,000, over 54,000, or over 50,000 actually, 54,000 people say red meat is not bad for you. Now, the UN came out a few years ago saying red meat is bad, we have to cut down our consumption, uh, there's a bunch of other groups pushing it, we're supposed to eat bugs and insects instead, uh, we're supposed to stop eating red meat because cows fart and that's bad for the environment and all this sort of thing. A lot of that stuff is crap. And I'm going to go over this article uh, to, and, and sort of uh, refer to some of that. But I think this is really important. Um, you know, there have been other people that have had health problems from not eating enough meat. Uh, Professor Jordan Peterson talked about how eating more meat uh, helped save his daughter's health, helped save his own health, helped him lose weight and be stronger. Um, there's a famous football player who switched to a vegan or vegetarian diet. Now he's getting injured all the time. There's concerns about that. And there's lots and lots of other concerns. So when humans have eaten meat for thousands and thousands of years, this push to sort of stop us from eating meat can actually be really dangerous, especially when in the West in particular, we don't have a very complex vegetarian diet. Now you can look at Hindus in India. Right now, Hindus in India are typically vegetarian. They don't eat meat at all. No meat at all. Um, now, uh, first of all, you don't see many Hindu Indians win winning Olympic gold medals. You don't see them playing many sporting sports. You don't see them, uh, uh, you know, in, in the NFL, in the NBA, playing international soccer. Uh, you see them, you know, when you tip. Typical picture a typical Indian, you you picture kind of a slight skinny Gandhi like dude, right? Uh, not a big muscly you know type of guy, right? Um, and so that's one thing when it comes to Hindus in India. It's like okay, well yeah, they don't eat meat, uh, but they're not exactly the biggest strongest people in the world either, right? Um, and and the second thing is when it comes to Hindus in India, um, they often have a very complex vegetarian diet. You know, thousands of years of being vegetarian, thousands of years of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, cooking uh, in a warm climate and having all these little legumes and beans and all these little then turmeric and all these amazing things that are grown in India means that, yeah, you could probably do pretty well if you have a very complex diet. But in the West, if, if you typically aren't aware of that stuff, or you don't cook that stuff, or those ingredients aren't available, and you're stuck between a regular salad and a Caesar salad or a garden salad or whatever, then you're not going to get enough nutrition to compensate for the lack of meat that you eat. So in the West, it's actually very dangerous. So, um, <clears throat> you know, just going over that, um, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll look at this article from Breitbart News. Uh, one of my favorite news sites, great uh, news and pop culture source, um, and they do a, a pretty a pretty good, honest job. There's a ton of news sites out there, but Breitbart, I recommend. Uh, everybody should check out B-R-E-I-T-B-A-R-T dot com. Um, and it says here, from Breitbart.com, outrage after researchers can't confirm red meat causes cancer. And there's a shot of a little kid gnawing on some meat. And this is by Victoria Friedman from October 1st, 2019. Now, it says here, can't confirm, so you would assume that uh, based on the editorial slant of this title, that the researchers were trying to confirm that red meat causes cancer. You know, they were given a directive. We know red meat is bad. That's the latest stud studies and science, you know, showing that and so on. So you go out there and prove it with a whole bunch of studies so we can keep saying it. And science often works that way. As people like Mike Adams from Natural News or Nick Begich from EarthPulse.com have said, Science is often really stubborn, 
whatever the scientific consensus is now, generally scientists, because they built their careers on it, they speak professionally about it and so on, they're very, very hesitant to change. But yet science, good science, is always changing and always questioning. So when you get scientists that say, nope, this is settled science, there's no such thing as settled science. Science is always changing. We thought the earth revolved around, or the sun revolved around the earth, then we switched to the earth revolves around the sun. Now with all the flat earth stuff, who the hell knows? But the point is, it's always changing and you should always be able to question it. So, um, you know, now that the latest scientific consensus is supposed to be um, that that red meat is bad for you, um, you know, uh, we're supposed to all reflect that in our thinking, in our, in our discussions about science. When the best scientists would go, bring me your best evidence, right? Prove I'm right or prove I'm wrong. And if I'm proven wrong, fantastic. Then I'll stop repeating wrong stuff and I'll get on to saying right stuff, just like anybody else should be happy to. So um, let's get into this article. It says here, scientists have found there is little evidence that eating red meat causes health problems. The research, led by Dalhousie University and McMaster University in Canada, counters official guidance from the World Health Organization, WHO, which in 2015 labeled meat a carcinogenic. Now, this gets to the big nationalism versus globalism question as well. Nationalists, people want to defend their country, defend their borders, defend their cultures, defend their sovereignty, defend their economies, defend the fact that they're great countries, right? You're proud to be an Italian, you're proud to be a Nigerian, you're proud to be an Indian, you're proud to be a Brazilian, Chinese, American, you know, uh, French, whatever you are, right? And um, and you'd be like, well, what, what, why? Why would you need to be a nationalist? Duh. Doesn't it make sense? Nah, not exactly. Or yes and no. Yes, it does, except the big threat against that is globalism. Super rich, evil people want a global form of communism so that they can control all the resources of the world and centrally control the world with their big bureaucracies like the United Nations and World Health Organization and World Trade Organization and International Criminal Court and so on. And so what they want to do is they want to weaken people and cultures and countries and open borders and have a big borderless world where people are running this way and that way looking for jobs because the economy is being taken down. That's the sort of new globalist communism that they're pushing. So broadly speaking, them being against red meat and raising the prices and saying it's bad for the environment and advising us not to eat it for health reasons could be them messing with us to weaken us, right? You get a generation of men raised on red meat who can kick some ass, hmm, tougher to deal with. You get the next generation of, of, of men raised to eat like rabbits, and they don't turn into lions, right? That's that's part of this program. So that's important to keep in mind. And you look, you can look into that more on your own as well. I'll get into, into this article. Um, <clears throat> so back to this article. The paper was based on the research of a 14-strong international team of specialists and published on Monday in Annals of Internal Medicine. Bradley Johnston, associate professor, professor at Dalhousie University said, quote, based on the research, we cannot say with any certainty that eating red or processed meat causes cancer, diabetes, or heart disease. So basically, as I said in the title of this video, it's not bad for you, right? They, 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 they say, we have a 14 strong team of specialists and it's an international study and yet we can't say we know you want us to say that we know the World Health Organization put it out and everyone in the world is supposed to listen to them but we can't say that because we have the science we have the data and so we can't say that we tried but we can't and that's good news for everyone if we get this sort of thing out there and and push back against some of the brainwashing going on uh, against the value of eating meat and and all the ways that uh, that the system uh, is making it harder to. The study's author elaborated, quote, from twelve randomized controlled trials. So randomized means we're not choosing a specific group of people to 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 get a specific result. This is random. This is these people, those people, blah, 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 blah. So we have a good cross-section of people. And controlled trials. Now, controlled means they've got some people eating the red meat. They've got some people not eating the red meat. <clears throat> 
it's sort of like with drugs. It control, there's, there's certain controls in place. You take this drug, you take this sugar pill that's just a placebo, and we'll see if the drug has a positive effect or if it's just a placebo in your mind trying to make things work. So from 12 randomized controlled trials enrolling about 54,000 individuals, we did not find a statistically significant or an important association in the risk of heart disease, cancer, or diabetes for those that consumed less red or processed meat. So, um, excuse me, um, when it says here stati statistically significant or important association, that speaks to how science works. A lot of people don't know, you know, how science works in terms of, you know, what they do. Sometimes they actually find a lot of data Sometimes they're just looking at a pile of data and they're looking at the difference between causation and correlation, right? Is it, did this cause this or is this simply happening at the same time as this, right? Um, for example, um, when it comes to HIV AIDS, a very controversial topic people were taught to freak out over, there's a reason that um, uh, uh, despite the fact that AIDS was huge in the 1980s and people have been having a lot of sex since then, look at the population of the world, that we don't see AIDS all over the place today. Most people don't know somebody that has AIDS or has HIV. It's not AIDS. You get HIV and then that turns into AIDS. Yeah, okay, stop screaming. Do you even understand what the hell you're talking about, right? Um, but when it comes to that, you know, I did, um, excuse me, I did a great um, interview and I did some other research on this as well. I did a great interview with a gentleman from Western Canada named David Crow a few years ago from my radio show. And David Crow is a, a, an engineer and computer scientist by training, but he also looks into a lot of health stuff. So smart guy, but quote unquote, not a doctor. But just because you're not a doctor doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you can't listen to other doctors and other medical professionals. So for example, if you're not a doctor, but you can see 10 doctors say this and one doctor says that, you might be like, well, obviously the 10 doctors are right and the one is wrong. Not necessarily. The one could be going against their the medical industry, their medical profession. They could be uh, at risk of being ridiculed, losing their job, censured for what they're saying. And, and yet they still have the courage to say that no, even though those 10 doctors say X, this one doctor saying Y, is more credible because they're taking more risks and they have a good explanation. You can't just say they're automatically right, but they are certainly worth listening to when it comes to all sorts of health issues out there, including, you know, red meat or vaccines or fluoride or HIV AIDS. So back to HIV AIDS. <clears throat> um, I interviewed David Crow a few times on a couple of different things and uh, among a, a wide variety of people, including doctors and scientists in their own field and authors and journalists and so on, right? Um, and David Crow said, based on the science, um, HIV and AIDS does not, uh, has not been found, right? You have to be a little careful. Can you say it does not exist? Uh, I mean, does not nah, can't really say it doesn't exist in the sense that nobody knows for sure everything and anything in the entire universe, but they can't find HIV and AIDS, right? So what does that mean? What that means is HIV AIDS tests, they don't test for the AIDS virus itself, right? They'll be like, oh, there's a little AIDS virus. That's what it looks like. It's wriggling. It kind of looks like this. It's long. It's skinny. And, and there it is. We found it in the blood swimming along. That's the HIV virus. They don't test for that. They test for antibodies related to a weak immune system. And then they say, well, we can't find the HIV virus itself, but if, you know, 7 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 other factors are there, like antibodies are there, then we can assume the HIV virus must be there. There's no pictures of the HIV virus. There's illustrations of it. They'll have, you know, cool little artist renditions of what the HIV virus looks like, but they don't actually, they, they don't, won't actually show you a picture of it. And, you know, this is a controversial issue, and so if this turns you off, I apologize, but you can look into this for yourself. Um, but, you know, broadly speaking, where's all the HIV AIDS cases? Why Magic Johnson's still alive? And so on. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'll tell you how, how it works, right? As David Crow said, the AIDS tests are different in different countries. So if you go to Africa, you've got to get 5 out of 10 on the AIDS test for them to say you have AIDS. 
if you go to France, you got to get 8 out of 10 factors, like this antibody was there, this thing was there, this symptom that, you know, indicates a weak immune system, could be AIDS, blah, blah, blah. So the tests are different in different countries. So that means if you go to Africa and you got a weak immune system, you come down with a cold, you come down with a fever, you know, you, you're, you're dealing with, a, have difficulties adjusting to the, the temperature change or the travel, the stress, the whatever, and you go to a clinic in Africa and get tested for AIDS, they might see your weak immune system and say, you have AIDS. We are so sorry about this, uh, but we have to put you on AIDS drugs right away that will make the pharmaceutical companies rich, right? And if you go to France, the same person, the same condition, the same blood that they test, and you go to France, you go to an AIDS clinic, they'll say, oh, 5 out of 10 instead of 8 out of 10 factors, eh, maybe you just got a cold. You know what? Go home, drink some orange juice, get some sleep, take some vitamin C, and you know your immune system will probably be healthier in the next few days. That's how crazy the AIDS tests are. So, you know, I, I bring that up, um, you know, as 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 part of this to show to sort short sort of show you, you know, what science is working with. And without going on and on and on about AIDS, from my memory of this conversation, this research I did a while back, um, basically. Uh, in Africa, if you have a weak immune system, then they can say you have AIDS. Now, what causes a weak immune system? Stress, poor diet, uh, l bad lifestyle, you know, drug use. There's all sorts of factors that could contribute to that. That's also why a lot of gay men and gay guys were, 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 were um, uh, said to have AIDS in the 1980s. They get these guys that were strung out from partying and doing drugs and random sex and, and stressed out and, and maybe living double lives and blah, blah, blah. And they brought them in and they tested them and they said, well, you're, you're HIV positive because you have acquired immune deficiency syndrome or basically you have a weak immune system. And then they would put them on drugs like AZT which is known to be toxic. AZT was known to kill people. They tried using it as a cancer drug in the 70s, and they're like, no, this is too toxic. Yeah, it kills cancer, but it kills you too, right? It's like, yeah, you could say, you know, getting hit by a bus cures cancer. Yeah, it does. It'll kill you both. And when you're dead, the cancer won't be able to continue living and, and harming you, but you're both dead, right? So that's what AZT was in the 70s. And then the 80s, they brought it back as part of the initial... Uh, AIDS, HIV, AIDS cocktail, right? To to um, to uh, to uh, to administer to people who, who supposedly had AIDS to kill the AIDS. But in fact, what it did was it. That's why you see people skinny, weak, tired. The Tom Hanks movie Philadelphia having sores on their body. A lot of that could be from the drugs and other factors, right? A weak immune system is not good. But saying you have a weak immune system and that means you have AIDS is a lot different than actually finding the AIDS itself. So I, I went on that AIDS, um, uh, 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 you know, tangent, and you can look up the word of David Crow, D-A-V-I-D, uh, C-R-O-W-E, and you can type in HIV, AIDS, or you can see his work. You can look at other scientists. You can look at tons of scientists that have signed petitions saying, no, you know, we, we, we're, we're not saying to be politically correct and to try and appeal to people that are on the fence that have been hammered by brainwashing. We're not saying that it's not possible. We're just saying we have all these questions, blah, blah, blah. So it's like when it comes to climate change. Not saying the climate doesn't change. Not saying that. Just saying it's not an emergency. And human activity is not the main driver. That is a is a way of, of appealing to people on the fence or in the middle or even on the other side to say, no, no, you're right, I agree, but, 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 as opposed to this is total bullshit, which is a lot harder to sort of convince the other side and people uh, in the middle of, if you, if you uh, take that approach. So um, <clears throat> I bring this up, I bring all this up to uh, to say here, that when the, the study says we did not find a statistically significant or an important association in the risk of heart disease, cancer, or diabetes for those that consumed less red or processed meat, uh, when we studied 54,000 people uh, in 12 different randomized controlled trials, that gives you an idea of what they were doing. They were seeing the red meat eaters and the others. They were looking at a variety of factors and they were trying to correlate patterns to see if there's any causation, and so they couldn't. Could another study in the future? It's possible. But did this study? No, right? 
and that is not a 1 plus 1 equals 2 example. That's a, there's some 1s, and there's some 1s, and there's some 2s, and 3s, and 4s, and there's a big mess of data, and we're looking for patterns in that data. So it's never an exact science, and I'm glad that uh, this wording of this helps reflect that. So back to this article. Johnson remarked on how this should affect meat eaters' diets, telling the BBC the right choice for the majority of people, but not everyone, is to continue their meat consumption. So the scientists saying the right choice for, you know, um, the majority of people, but not everyone. And there might be some people out there who've got some bad reactions to meat, or who've got some issues, who've got some religious or ethical concerns, who can find other ways to supplement their diet to make up for some of the shortfall they get when it comes to, to not eating meat. No problem. But for most people, it's fine. And you compare this to, um, you know, a, a tweet that Breitbart London put out here. Delling poll, Looney Greens demand meat tax, where they say, well, meat's bad for you, bad for the earth. We should tax it until you can't afford it and you can't eat it anymore. What in fact, it's not bad for you, and many studies actually show it's really good for you. So not only is it not bad for you, it can actually be really good for you. So instead of going, well, it's probably, excuse me, it's probably bad for you anyway, so we might as well tax it, might as well you eat less, probably better. No, total BS, right? Probably not bad for you in most cases. For most people, probably good for you. Shouldn't tax it more, shouldn't make it harder to get, shouldn't make it more expensive, shouldn't propagandize against it. You should be honest about this sort of stuff. And that's why this article, I think, is really important. So um, back to this article, some of the academic community praised the report's rigor. Open University Emeritus Professor of Applied Statistics Kevin McConway said it was an, quote, extremely comprehensive piece of work. Professor David Spiegelhalter from the University of Cambridge said, quote, this rigorous, even ruthless review does not find good evidence of important health benefits from reducing meat consumption. In fact, it does not find any good evidence at all. So, Based on these quotes, and based on the, the title of this article, and based on the tenor of this article, it really looks like these Canadian scientists in communist Canada, you know, a very liberal country with probably liberal scientists that have to get liberal scientist grants, and they want to work for the World Health Organization one day, or they basically live on saying, hey, I'm, I'm a scientist. I need to get a, a grant. I need a million dollars so I can hire some people to help me study something. Which means if I go against the establishment, then I'm probably not going to get that million dollars. So they really don't want it. They wanted to find out that red meat was causing cancer. That's why they did this study. But based on what it says here, <clears throat> they, they tried to find that meat was bad for you. They tried really hard. And they said, despite the uh, ruthless review, um, there's no evidence that reducing meat consumption um, is, uh, is, 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 is good for your health. No evidence at all. That's what they say. And these poor scientist bastards are probably like, I'm sorry, we tried. We tried as hard as we could. We used the scientific method. We had 12 different studies, over 54. We tried, we tried, we tried. Please, please don't blame us. Please don't. We tried so hard to prove meat was bad for you, but we couldn't. And that's really good news for everyone else, right? And even for them, hopefully if we get more truth out there and less sort of corruption, we can clean up science so they don't have to be going for conclusions, um, anti-human conclusions, um, you know, at the behest of, of globalists and other, you know, evil, corrupt people. Back to this article. While Ian Johnson, a nutritional expert at the UK's Quadrum Institute, welcomed the findings, telling Reuters, this study will, I hope, help to eliminate the incorrect impression that some meat products are as carcinogenic as cigarette smoke and to discourage dramatic media headlines claiming that bacon is killing us. So basically this guy's a nutrition expert at the UK's Quadrum Institute. Again, another liberal, the UK, United Kingdom, very, very much a liberal uh, globalist, uh, a, bra uh, a bastion of brainwashing. Even they're going... I hope this, this helps set some people straight. And that's why I'm making this vlog. 
And that's why sharing this article and info is so important. But there, he, he's saying, this guy, who's a nutritional expert, a, a professional, is saying that um, he's lambasting propaganda, comparing meat to uh, being as dangerous, carcinogenic as cigarette smoke, and uh, to discourage, uh, and, and, and to, he's trying to discourage dramatic media headlines claiming that bacon is killing us. So that's why this article and this sort of study is so important, because otherwise, this is what is out there. And you may have seen the new push for veggie burgers and, and so on, either made with pea protein or soy protein. Um, and there's a lot of um, evidence that a lot of those burgers out there now being pushed everywhere beyond meat or alternative meat or whatever, whatever, they're actually not better for you than meat. They're not. They're not better for you when it comes to your health, your digestion. Your, they could be worse when it comes to the salt content, the processing. Soy, obviously really bad for you feminizes men against their will, shrinks your balls, scrambles girls' eggs, has little kids hitting puberty, little girls that are 12 at 8 years old, uh, causes breast cancer, because soy basically uh, produces estrogen, a form of estrogen, xenoestrogen, a type of estrogen in your body. So you pump it in guys, and guys get all femmed out against their will. Not a guy who's taking it seriously, just a guy who's getting a lot bitchier than he should be. And girls, yeah, jacks up their estrogen to unnatural levels, so they get a lot bitchier than they should be. If you wonder why people are a lot bitchier than they should be, soy is something to avoid. You can look into that more as well. Um, and even pea protein, you know, relatively healthy, but still not better than meat. So these Beyond Meat burgers and all that sort of thing that's being pushed out there is really an anti-human agenda disguised as saving people and saving the planet. And that's why it's important to get the alternative science and facts out there. So, um, back to this article. The Guardian, giant mainstream paper in Europe, out of England, sort of like the New York Times of Europe, one of the, the biggest papers out there. The Guardian reported that most scientists said the methodology used was thorough. However, the majority of views published in the media were highly negative. So, there's a spin. They're trying to spin this story as being negative. And like a lot of ways that people spin things as being negative that are true these days, it's not about the facts, it's about the feelings, right? This makes me feel so bad, I am outraged, I am a mess, this is ridiculous, this is so irresponsible, I can't, it's like, no, wait a second, why can't you calm down and kind of calmly explain in detail, you know, why this is bad, right? But that's not what they do, right? So let's get into this. The Guardian did a pretty good job, and a lot of mainstream media does initially, right? They get a story, they, they, they use their journalistic skills, they follow the facts where the facts lead them, and they put the story out. Later on, when there's a collective way of thinking about this that's supposed to be agreed on by the mass media and, and, and enforced upon everyone else, that's when they start spinning things. So this same Guardian reporter that reported on this study and kind of snuck the article in there into, into the Guardian paper, um, you know, later on, the same author might write an article completely against the previous article because the prevailing wisdom will be studies debunked, studies crap, meets bad for you, can't trust it, makes people feel bad, irresponsible to put it out there, how dare you, blah, 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 right? Um, <clears throat> that's why there's a lot of rare news that's reported but not repeated, that's more likely to be the truth than not, and you'll have aggregator sites like Breitbart News, Infowars.com, Gateway Pundit, many others that take these individual stories uh, of news that's reported but not repeated, and they'll, you know, copy them on their site or share parts of them or do stories based on those stories because people in the mainstream media have the expertise, uh, they've got the skills, they've got the name, they can get access to info, they can get people to return their phone calls, they can get people to do interviews, they've got the resources to send people different places to, to, to go investigate things. So it's not like they're all good or all bad. It's that, um, you know, just like a lawyer knows they can't wear track pants to court, court uh, journalists know what they can and cannot say. And if there's enough blowback when it comes to this article about this study, then that same reporter and the entire newsroom will know, okay, from now on, 
Anytime there's a study like this that exonerates the dangers of red meat and says it's actually good for you and not really bad for you, we all now know, based on the blowback from putting this information out there, that we shouldn't report on it or we shouldn't talk about it favorably, right? So that's how the media works. Um, <clears throat> So, um, back to this article. The Guardian uh, did a pretty good job on this, but the majority of views published in the media was highly, were highly negative. Professor Walter Willett from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, who was a vegan, called the study, quote, the most egregious abuse of evidence that I have ever seen. Right? So that's this guy who's a um, from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a vegan, who says the most egregious abuse of evidence that I have ever seen. Now, whether it is or isn't the most egregious abuse of evidence that he has ever seen, the fact that he's a vegan, the fact that he's pushing the kind of globalist anti-meat agenda means that it's not even about, well, let me explain to you as a Harvard man how flawed this study was. Here's point one, here's point two, here's point three. I hope I've set you straight, dear boy, because I'm from Harvard. No, he doesn't do that. He talks about, this is the most egregious abuse of evidence I've ever seen. Freaks out over it, right? That's the point, is the freak out, right? That's the quote that, um, that the authors use. His colleague, Dr. Frank Hu, said it was, quote, irresponsible and unethical to issue dietary guidelines that are tantamount to promoting meat consumption, even if there is still some uncertainty about the strength of the evidence. Okay, so great, right? So this guy was is saying it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible. You study uh, 12 different studies of 54,000 people, right? One of the largest studies I've ever heard of. There's, there's some bigger ones, obviously, but, but it's a huge one. And you say this is irresponsible and unethical. No, it would be irresponsible and unethical not to talk about this, not to get rid of old science, right? It's like, you know, if you if you if you if if you if you got shoes and you don't have shoelaces, and somebody comes along and says, Hey, I've invented shoelaces. You know, if you tie these together with little holes in them, then they stop flipping off your feet. You could say, What it's irresponsible and unethical to suggest that we should put little pieces of string into little holes in the tops of our shoes to tie them together, to keep them tied onto our feet, to stop them from falling off so we can walk faster and be more comfortable. No, this is the latest evidence. We had shoes before, and now we've got something better to make the shoes better. Well, we had nutritional information before, and now we've got better nutritional information to make it better. If something comes along after this, it should replace this, right? But this is the stubbornness of science I talked about at the beginning of this uh, this vlog. So um, back to sort of um, the sort of bitching about this. This is the great globalist bitch out. How bad you feel, uh, you know, how messed up you are. These are doctors, or at least healthcare uh, or health education professionals that are talking about how this is irresponsible, this is ridiculous, this is egregious, this is crazy. They're not explaining this from a scientific perspective, knocking down this study. They're doing the same kind of great globalist bitch out, uh, lying liberal uh, uh, bullshit that um, that a lot of people do, which is talk about how, how messed up they are, how bad they feel. And that's fashionable out there. It's fashionable for people to do it, not fashionable people to help each other out, fashionable people to empathetically bitch, especially with attacks on gender, attacks on men. Men's main job is make sure you don't bitch out, your boys don't bitch out, your girls and kids don't bitch out. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Don't bitch out. Don't let your boys bitch out, girls or kids bitch out. That's it. Right? This is the exact opposite of that. Because if you don't have that, you've got girls. What do girls do? Girls empathize. Right? Girls empathize. Now, talk to girls, know girls, like girls, respect girls, you know, fan of girls being allowed to be girls, guys being allowed to be guys, and anybody else wants to do something else, try and fit into something good there and don't be an ass, right? You don't want to switch sides. Try and be good at being a girl or a guy. Don't just be an obnoxious mess. Um, but girls are more likely to uh, to empathize, right? <clears throat> so, you know, um, for example, I was talking with that with my cousin's uh, roommate at uh, at university, right? My cousin, female, and um, and 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 her friend, just a random example from from my past, and her female friend roommate, and I was chatting with her roommate, 
And she's like, oh, yeah, your cousin's great. She's such a, a great girl. You know, she's, she's so cool to be a roommate with, you know, but she is, you know, very much a wishy-washy, ev hope everyone likes me girl, not a don't give a shit if we have to fight guy, right? Because girls are more, hope everyone likes me, hope people are nice to me, hope people are happy, hope I make, hope, uh, hope, hope I'm good company, you know, hope I fit in, hope they don't reject me, not, so what if we got to fight? We got to fight, we got to fight. That's more of a man thing to do, right? And it's good to have both. It's good to have girls so that we get along better, we're nicer to each other. It's good to have men so we can handle some real shit if shit happens, if shit goes down. And um, back to my cousin and her female roommate, both girls. My cousin's roommate was saying about my cousin, yeah, she's great, she's a great girl, a great roommate, but she's always agreeing with me. She's always empathizing with me. She's always, you know, if, if, if I get a bad mark on a paper, I say, oh, I got a bad mark on a paper, ugh, you know, my professor sucks, then my cousin, her roommate, will go, yeah, he totally sucks, he must totally suck, you're great, girl, you can't believe that, uh, that, uh, that, that your professor would do that to you, right? And she was saying to me, I like that type of support a lot of the times, but I could also use a little pushback, you know, from the old noggin, more of where some girls could do it, or more of where a man would come in and go, well, what happened? Did you work hard in the paper? Did you do a good job? Did you, did you, whatever? Is that guy being a jerk or are you just bitching because you didn't work hard enough to get a good grade and now you want some sympathy, right? So girls are more likely to empathize and, uh, and, and, and less likely to kind of get you past being messed up. Girls are more likely, I'm so sad. Oh, I know. It's so sad. Whereas guys be like, hey, don't be sad. Don't cry. Stop. Stop. We can fix this. We, we can fix No, you have to let me. You don't know how bad. I know how bad you feel. You just don't have to feel that bad for that long. Like, we'll, 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 we'll get past this. Come on. Chop, 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 chop. Right? Because uh, of the attacks on masculinity and masculine behavior, we're all supposed to be empathizing with how messed up everyone is, which makes everyone a mess easier to control. And that's reflected even in, the, in these uh, medical... Uh, and healthcare professional statements about this particular study. So um, back to this article, Oxford University's Dr. Marco Springman called it, quote, dangerously misguided. So dangerously misguided. Now that's not a scientific kind of thing. That's sort of a philosophical, uh, ideological look at this. Um, Dr. Giotta Mitru from the World Cancer Research Fund said the public could be put at risk if they accepted this research as a fact and refused to cut down on their meat consumption, yeah, the public could be put at risk, or the public could also be a lot healthier if they eat a lot more meat, right? So these are generic statements that are meant to make you feel bad and empathize with them, but they're not actually definitive. Dangerously misguided? How? Right? Public could be put at risk, yeah, or the public could be a lot healthier and helped a lot by this information. Right. So this is official scientists. Possibly line liberal bitches begging to be broken, as many are, based on the fact that they can't stand to, to, to say and hear this stuff that much. And then when they act sketchy, sheepish, sideways, lying, bitchy, sketchy, but they can't stand to see it that much. And they have to force each other to put up with each other. Um, and they like being ignored or crapped on, as I've got tons of evidence at manforwars.com showing. So they're probably sick of fashionably acting like this, and yet this reveals how they're acting. So if you look at the people that are talking about the study as being a, 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 a positive and clearing up some bad information about meat and saying it's bad, and then you look at the people criticizing the study and its results and its findings and the uh, dissemination of information about said study, you can see the difference. The, the former were carefully professional in explaining the study and its potential benefits and, and, and findings, and the latter are just a mess. And the idea is, I'm supposed to be such a mess, you see how much of a mess I am about this? That's why you should agree with me. When, typically, adults, you're supposed to be, you see how cool I am? You see? You see how what I learned, what I know, what I say, and what I do makes me so much cooler than you? Well, guess what? I can pass it on, and you can be cool too. All right, all right, all right. 
to paraphrase Matthew McConaughey, right? So you have to be careful in general about this way of looking at the world because it's pushed out there a lot. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a technique. It's a tactic. It's, it's a way to make us all act like a bitch or a bitch's bitch who makes more bitches, who make more bitches, who make more bitches, until that's all we do, all we are, and we have trouble looking at and talking to each other, listening to each other, and we're easier to control, right? Because then there are no responsible adults making sure that doesn't happen. There's just, what, what, what? Now I'm all messed up. You see how I'm messed up? Okay, fine, fine, fine. No more shoelaces for shoes. I promise. No. Nope. But I don't, I don't want to wear shoelaces. How dare you say that this is what? Okay, fine. Forget it. Forget the whole shoelace idea entirely. Walk around with your shoes, kind of loosen your foot, you know, falling off every few feet, stumbling around. Sorry. I apologize. I won't bring up the shoelaces idea again because you're such a mess. As opposed to you can listen to me where I say, no, I'm happy with the shoelaces. I'm calm. I'm confident. I'm, I'm not all messed up. This is different. Doesn't mean you have to start crying just because it challenges because you bought shoes without shoelaces. And you think you made a mistake and you feel guilty or upset or you don't want to feel like you did something wrong. Doesn't mean you got to start crying and then, and then, and then reject this idea. That is fashionably out there. And uh, even in science, you can see this reflected. Oops. So um, <clears throat> getting back to this article, and I'll put a link to it below. Um, it says here, the NHS, that's the National Health Service in England, their socialized uh, national health care system, which um, is, is, is uh, getting more and more expensive uh, because companies can charge it whatever it wants. It's just the taxpayers paying. It's not a private uh, 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 free enterprise uh, type system. It's uh, one where it's like, well, we can just keep charging the government and the taxpayers more and the government can either tax people more or go, go further into debt, uh, you know, when it comes to this. Um, and then, even despite all of that, because it's one system, there's no competition across all of England, they can cut the number of services, shrink the number of services, make wait times longer. There's no competition to spur it to improve. So the NHS and, and, and other sort of national socialist healthcare systems are very, very dangerous. Now, could you have a public healthcare system? Sure. When it comes to the responsibilities of healthcare, Maybe the government should have some role. It's debatable. But should you also have competitive private health care systems? More than likely, right? Because that brings costs down, spurs competition, innovation, and so on. Anyway, um, so the NHS advises that anyone eating more than 90 grams of red or processed meat a day to lower their intake to 70 grams. That is the equivalent of two rashes of bacon, one and a half sausages, one third of a half pound of steak, or just five tablespoons of cooked mince. Public Health England has said that despite the research, they will not be reviewing their guidelines. So again, this is the stubbornness of science, right? Public Health England said despite the research, they will not be reviewing their guidelines. Now, it's a massive study. As I said, 12 different studies, 54,000 people. You would think that Public Health England could say, hold on, we're Public Health England. We're responsible for the public health in England. Now, we're not saying we did a crappy job before and our findings up to this point are wrong. But we are saying if there is some new significant evidence out there, then we should take a close look at it. Right? But instead, immediately, they said they will not be reviewing their guidelines. Nope. We at the Public Health of England have come up with amazing guidelines saying reduce your red meat consumption as much as you can. Uh, by the way, hey, PHE, we found this study saying that, you know, red meat is actually not bad for you. It doesn't have any negative health risks based on all the ones we're looking for. But we are not reviewing our guidelines. Yeah, but you're supposed to be based on science. Ah, 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 we are not reviewing our guidelines. This is irresponsible of Public Health England, right? And um, <clears throat> there's many examples of, of <clears throat> science and scientists and, uh, and other sort of uh, bureaucracies responsible for public health and public interest uh, being irresponsible when it comes to science and scientific findings, right? And, and other matters of public policy. For example, when it comes to fluoride, right? I made this point years ago, make it here and there when, when it comes up today. But when it comes to fluoride in the water supply, 
lots of controversy around fluoride, right? And uh, lots of places don't use it. Lots of places do. You know, blah, 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 blah. The people that are pro-fluoride freak out on you. The people that are anti-fluoride can calmly explain a bunch of reasons why it's not a good idea. Um, and, and, and so um, when it comes to something like the city of Calgary, Alberta, uh, which is a province in Canada, so Calgary in, in Western Canada, they, after a bunch of their citizens got active, they got together meetings, meet and greet tables with the community, posters, flyers, got some independent mainstream media coverage, got some local city councillors to look at the issue. Calgary, Alberta, a city of over a million people, took fluoride out of their water supply in 2011. They're the fourth biggest city in Canada. I think it's uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, right? The city of Toronto didn't call Calgary and go, hey, I heard you guys got the fluoride. Yeah? Well, why'd you do that? You know, we have, you know, three, four, five million people here in Toronto. So if you guys took it out and you're saving a bunch of money and you're saying it's better for your health, you know, talk to us about it. They didn't do that. They were just like, well, so we refuse to review our guidelines, just like Public Health England is refusing to do when it comes to this um, this health issue. So it's one of those things where you're like, well, why wouldn't you, if you are the city council in Toronto and you've got your public health department and, and, and you know, other scientific actuaries after a fashion, why wouldn't you say, OK, Calgary took it out. They're saving money. It's better for their health. At least that's what, you know, they decided based on the evidence they looked at. If they made that huge decision, why can't another big city in Canada look at their example and not change everything right away, drop of a hat? but at least want to look at the evidence and want to have a discussion about why, right? But this is the sort of bureaucratic resistance in the scientific community and other bureaucracies that normal people have to transcend out there, just like with, with videos like this. Um, so um, back to this article. <clears throat> While some scientists have been pushing to stop meat consumption on the grounds that it is bad for one's health, others have led with the angle that it must be reduced because of the so-called, quote, climate emergency. Emergency! Last week, a British barrister called for meat to be considered a form of ecocide and made illegal. Um, and that's the end of the article. And it says here, there's a tweet from Breitbart London, poll, Britons won't surrender meat and driving to stop climate change from Breitbart London. And uh, there is an example of the tweet. And the end of the article. Um, and yeah, and this is, a, this is again, more BS. There's no huge climate emergency. The same people that have been going on and on about that have been doing it for the last 50 years with overpopulation. This goes back to Thomas Malthus, and he even stole it from somebody else like three, four hundred years ago. This is a favorite trick of super rich people, right? Super rich evil people in charge like to say, we don't have enough. It's all your fault. It's like, hey, super rich king, are you going to give up some of your stuff? No, we're in charge. Forget it. You have to give it up. You've got to give up your car. You've got to give up your meat. You've got to give up your straws. You've got to stop flying. You've got to stop driving. You've got to use less. You have to do all this because we are running out of stuff. How about you rich people in charge? No, wait. It's the same thing today. So three, four hundred years ago, Thomas Malthus came up with the idea of overpopulation. He said, or I think he even stole it from somebody else. I forget who. But the point is that and the elites, the rich people love this because it's used to control and kill people, right? And they do that in case people get too populous or too out of control and think of, of kicking their ass and kicking them out of power. And so Thomas Malthus said, um, population increases arithmetically and food increases exponentially, or no, um, uh, food increases arithmetically and population increases exponentially. So we're going to run out of food soon if we don't stop having babies or kill a bunch of people, right? Basically, um, food goes one, two, three, four, five, six, whereas population goes one, two, four, eight, 12, 24. So there'll be six apples for 24 people, which means they're going to starve. That was hundreds of years ago. That's been disproven for hundreds of years and yet brought back in fashion to save for hundreds of years. So they've been saying that, um, you know, for two, three hundred years uh, since Malthus was around. And they were saying that in the 1950s and 60s and 70s 
and 80s, when in reality, if you take all 7, 8 billion people in the world, they could have 3,000 square feet of physical land each in Australia. So 3,000 square feet per person in just the continent of Australia. You can do the math, take a calculator, but it was 7 billion people and X millions uh, square feet or whatever that or miles that Australia is or square feet that is, you can do a calculator. You can say, wait a minute, there's this many people, right? Basically seven, eight billion people. And this is the square footage of the continent of Australia. We could put each person. Now you can't literally physically do this because of barriers and water and mountains. And so it's not, 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 I'm not saying practically, I'm just saying mathematically as an example. You take everyone in the world, you give them a 3,000 square foot chunk of land, each, each of seven plus billion people in just Australia. So that's not practical, possible, who'd want to do that? But extrapolating out from there, you say seven, eight billion people and the land mass of the entire world, we don't have an overpopulation problem, we have a population mismanagement problem our super rich evil people in charge are stacking us on top of each other like chickens in a coop in condos and um, and so on. So overpopulations, BS, um, uh, technology and so on and other factors and innovation, um, you know, uh, can help us deal with that uh, advances in farming and food production and so on. So overpopulations, BS, um, uh, when it comes to climate change in the 70s, they were warning about global cooling. We're all going to freeze to death. That never happened. Then 80s, 90s, uh, you know, whatever started global warming, uh, you know, that never happened. Uh, they talked about the ozone layer. That never happened. And, and, and on and on and on and on. So they typically use these apocalyptic doomsday predictions to scare the crap out of us to make us easier to control. And when it comes to something like the climate or the weather or whatever, lots of reasons. So there's no climate emergency. Yes, the climate is always changing, but no, it is not human activity that is the main driver. The main driver is actually the sun, right? In reality, human activity and carbon dioxide, specifically what we exhale, is what plants inhale as part of this mixture to grow. It's plant food, and they put out oxygen into this mixture, which is human food. It gets into our blood supply, helps us grow, helps us be healthy, and so on, right? So it's not bad for the earth. It's only 4% of all this atmosphere, and the only 4% of all this, um, humans contribute at most 1% or 2% of that max, right? And that 1% or 2% of all this air atmosphere does not affect what the climate or weather is going to be like in a significant way. Does it have some? Yeah, maybe a tiny bit, just like the oceans do, just like the moon does, just like the waves do, just like clouds, just like volcanoes. Just like, there's many, is it a tiny contributing factor? Sure. But if we take our tiny fraction of all of this and we kill half the people on earth and say, you know what, humans are bad for the earth, kill half of them or kill 90% of them, it still wouldn't affect the weather much. The main driver of the weather, as most farmers have known, because they had to know it because they could, they could plan their farming, um, is the sun, the Earth's proximity to the sun, the intensity and brightness of the sun. This is something that's been known for a long time, and many climate scientists can talk about that. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring that up um, as part of this to say, look, um, it's, they, can say, they can say anything. You know, uh, they can say anything and say in 20 years from now, we're all screwed if we don't do this. But, you know, a Nigerian uh, uh, king or prince can call you and say, hello, I'm calling as a Nigerian king or prince. Please send me $5,000 and in six months I'll send you $6 million or $5 million, right? And it's probably a scam, just like this global warming climate change crap is and just like the anti-red meat agenda is. So um, anyway, that's the article from Breitbart News. I'll put a link to it below. Uh, but I hope that that helped clarify some things and hope to hope, you know, it can give you a better understanding of, of some of the big memes and propaganda and how they work and how they're put out there and how they affect us and all that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, share, get in touch with questions or answers or ideas to work together or financial support. Otherwise, BK Black Krishna from ManForWars.com. Hope this helps and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.